Welcome to Factual America. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. This week, it is my pleasure to welcome Andrew Renzi, the award-winning director and producer of the Netflix docuseries, Pepsi, Where's My Jet? Here's the trailer. Now, the more Pepsi you drink, the more great stuff you're going to get. Play that again? No fine print came up. I don't care what anybody else says. That is a legit offer. In the 90s, Pepsi was famous for the advertising. It was a cool club to be in. Different world then, different John. This commercial comes on. Carrier Jet, 7 million Pepsi points. I really saw this as an opportunity to change my world. I'm like, I want the jet. My mind couldn't stop racing to try to figure out how to make this happen. We just couldn't drink that much Pepsi. I need to buy 1.4 million 12 packs. I knew there was one person that I could potentially get to bite on this. And then he pitched this idea. It's, it's crazy, it's insane. Six warehouses, somewhere in the neighborhood of 45 people. It would cost $4.3 million. But I'm reading the fine print. We found a loophole. Here we go. Bring on Pepsi. Hey, somebody sent us a check for $700,000 for the Harrier jet. What? Why? Seven million points, Harrier jet, you saw it. It's clearly a joke. This was a money grab opportunity. Then they changed the ad. We're just kidding here. A big corporation knows how to game the system. I'd use different language if I weren't on camera. You're on Netflix, so you can use whatever language you want. (laughs) Fuck them. Pepsi went on the offense. It was in no way an admission that we had done anything wrong. It was an admission of guilt. That was above my pay grade. Legal, they'll kill anything. It was something right out of Tom Clancy's story. I'm not going to prison over a damn jet. We need to shake things up a little bit. Plot twist. Michael Avenatti. You can read all about him, just Google his name. This is when things really started to get crazy. They never figured that there ever would be a John Lennon. What I have to lose. You wanted that jet. I want the jet. Johnny wants the jet. That was the trailer for the new Netflix docuseries, Pepsi, Where's My Jet? And this is Factual America. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Each week I watch a hit documentary and then talk with the filmmakers and their subjects. When a 20-year-old attempts to win a fighter jet in a Pepsi sweepstakes, he sets the stage for a David versus Goliath battle for the history books. Join us as we talk with award-winning director and producer Andrew Renzi about bringing this incredible story to the screen, hanging out eating hoagies with Michael Avenatti while on house arrest, and searching for antique forks for Wes Anderson. Stay tuned. Andrew Renzi, welcome to Factual America. How are things with you? Things are great. Thank you for being. Thank for having me. Sorry. Well, no, no problem. Uh, and um, just to remind our listeners and our viewers, we're talking with Andrew Renzi, the director and producer, among many things, I believe, of Pepsi. Where's my jet? The new Netflix docu series, which premiered on November seventeenth. So, welcome again to the podcast. And congratulations uh, for uh, getting this uh, project done and onto Netflix. So you must be very excited. Yeah, it's a fun week for sure to to get this thing out there. It's been a, been about a two and a half year uh, process, so it's really fun, really exciting. Yeah, and uh, I understand. I mean, I guess you're doing the dog and pony show, but uh, this is your first uh, podcast. So, uh, so I'm glad you're sharing your first time with us, if uh, so to speak. So, uh, if uh, but uh, for m- many of our audience, they will maybe have not seen this yet. Now, for someone who actually grew up during the 90s, I was a little surprised how little I remembered about this. But uh, I also understand this is quite big on social media and everything. But why don't you uh, just set the stage for us? What is what is Pepsi Where's My Jet all about? Give us a synopsis. If you don't yeah, mind. so so basically, um, you know, the the story takes place in kind of what's called the golden age of advertising, whereas the early '90s, when when advertising was really shifting to this kind of wild west mentality, where suddenly celebrities were endorsing big brands sort of shamelessly without being called sellouts. It was like 
David Bowie was suddenly holding a Pepsi can. You know, one of the coolest, <laughs> most idiosyncratic artists of all time is now holding a Pepsi can. And so yeah. there was this huge shift at that time where celebrities and culture and and brands were sort of clashing in this big big expensive way and so that's kind of the foundation of the story or the backdrop and then in the midst of all that pepsi came up with this ad campaign where they basically were selling pepsi and you could get points and you could get sunglasses or you could get a hat Mm -hmm. get a leather jacket and at the end of this sort of staple commercial that they made this high school kid lands a harrier jet on school grounds and it says for seven million points you can have this harrier jet and there's no fine print there's no just kidding there's no nothing and the commercial ends and meanwhile you know in the farthest corner of the united states there's this 20 year old mountain climber named john leonard who sees this commercial and very kind of unironically or uncynically says, I'm going to go get that jet. I'm going to get 7 million points and I'm going to go get that jet. Mm. And, and the show kind of about his journey to, to figure it out. Yeah. And then, I mean, as, I think you've, uh, obviously you've, you've summed it up quite well. That's pretty much episode one, I, th- I think, but uh, uh, I uh, no, it's, it, it's, it, it is a, it is an amazing time. I hadn't really, you know, it's, it's great thing about documentaries like this. I mean, I hadn't even really thought of how crazy and golden age of advertising the 90s were. Um, I mean, there was this... So the stage was that there was this big cola war, war, right? We'd moved from being in the Cold War back... We're in a war era now again, but this, the 90s were like this golden era of a lot of things, you know? So we're out yeah. of the Cold War, and now we're worried about which cola we prefer. Is that... Uh, and that this, this sort of Madison Avenue one-upmanship going on. Oh, for sure. And, and I... Love that about this story. I mean, there was there was literally a Wall Street journalist who whose entire beat was the Cola Wars. I mean, this was this was a huge deal at the time. Was Coke versus Pepsi? It was this was the this was sort of the and the funny thing is, is that was looked at as kind of the David and Goliath battle in the in 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 the corporate world where Pepsi was kind of this big underdog and Coke was always number one. And so you kind of got this like David and Goliath story wrapped up in another David and Goliath story where you have this kid that goes after this major behemoth of a brand and that behemoth of the brand it was always kind of second best yeah and so uh this uh this 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 kid you're talking about uh it's john leonard is his, his name i i think i remember uh and uh do you i mean was he really that naive <laughs> i mean no, oh. so, is yes and i think that that's why i love this story so much because there's this kind of spielbergian quality to this kid where he genuinely Humanly was just looking at this as an opportunity to go get this jet and uncynically was like, there's no fine print here. I, I really think that they're giving this challenge to us. They're not, this challenge is being presented to us and I'm going to go figure it out. I, I kind of love that about him. I mean, it's a typically American tale in that way. I mean, um, you know, I'm based here in the UK now, but I, I grew up there. I mean, yeah, the first thing you would look to see if there were any any disclaimers or any fine print. And when you see there isn't any, all you know, whammo, there's a there's a business opportunity. Yeah, exactly. And like, and the greatest thing is that it was a business opportunity, but if you really unpack it, it's like, what the hell is this guy gonna do with a Harrier jet? You know? <laughs> so it's like this incredible dream that he has that kind of feels like where's it gonna go? And so I just kind of love the spirit of it for that reason, where it was just sort of like, let me just take this big swing and whatever happens, happens. And it's almost like the frontal lobe isn't yet fully developed. So, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, I want the jet. <laughs> he's not even thinking yeah, about it. I'll sell hope, it on. I hope he hears that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not like he's even, or, you know, I'm, I'm not sure mine's developed yet. But, I mean, the thing is, it's, you know, it's not like he's even talking about selling it on to some rogue state or anything like that. He just, he's actually legitimately thinking, I can give people rides in this plane <laughs> or, I can, you know, or, what, or rent it out for uh, movies or whatever. Yeah, and not to give too much away of the show, but it's like there's a moment where where you really recognize that this kid is not about the money. Like this kid is yeah. about the jet. And it's this crazy turning point where you recognize that he's not an ambulance chaser. This guy is actually after a dream. Yeah. I mean, this is this is an incredible story, and it's four episodes, and there's so many twists in, in the tale. And, uh, you know, spo- I could say spoiler alerts, but we're not going to go into the details because there's just so much there. Um, but what, how did you, 
Uh, did you remember the story? Did you, I mean, you would have been a kid when this happened, but uh, um, how did you come across this? Yeah, you know, I I don't specifically remember the Harrier Jet or the commercial. I obviously remember the Cola Wars. I remember the flood of Pepsi commercials in my living room mm -hmm. every Super Bowl. And I remember the sort of context of the world at that time. But I definitely wasn't fully aware 25 years later of the uh of the of the commercial itself. But I was sitting with my my really close friend and my producer Andrew Corkin, and, and we were talking about crazy stories and he was like oh I, I like read this article about this crazy story and he kind of was like this would be a really cool fiction film you know this would be like mm. a great fiction movie where you know and i'm and i'm i read this article i can't remember where where the article was it was kind of this like do you remember when this kid tried to get it was like one of those articles you know and and i read it and i was like no like we got to find john leonard like let's go see what john leonard is doing right now in the world and see if he wants to tell this story, see if there's any there, there, you know, and it's a phrase that John uses a lot. Is there any there, there? And I love saying it now in context of the story, because that's like his, his, his roadmap is, is there any there, there? And um, so the process was then like, let me try to go find this guy. Yeah. And I tracked him down to Denali, Alaska, to a state park oh, cool. up in Alaska. Yeah. yeah. And I called Denali state park, you know, main hotline. And this woman answers and I'm like, hi, I'm trying to find John Leonard. And she's like, oh, may I ask, you know, who's calling us? Oh, my name's Andrew Renzi. I'm a documentary filmmaker. And she goes, this must be about the Pepsi case. <laughs> 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 and I was like, Jackpot, you know, <laughs> this is it. And, uh, and she wouldn't give me his number. She's like, I, I can't give you his number, but I can tell, I can pass along the message. And I sent about 30 emails to like random email addresses that I found online. I had no idea if it was him or not. And eventually he hit me back and he was like, listen, I love your persistence. I don't really want to tell this story. I've moved on. Like I have a whole life now. And, but then we got to talking and he was like, you know what, actually this would be really fun to unpack this. And, and especially when it comes to bringing Todd back into the fold, it was like an adventure right. all over again. But he was still, I mean, he, had, cause he and Todd are, as you find out in the, in the film, this other character, uh, Todd Hoffman are they're like practically lifelong friends now, but uh, he was still as he, they were still friends even at that point. It, you know, it, it, is that right? It's just to bring him back in to relive, relive this moment in the nineties. Yeah, I mean, they definitely like. I think that life. You know, John had some kids and he was moving all around, and so I'm. You know, I think that life had probably gotten in the middle of of how close they were at this I time. See in the nineties, but you know, they still had this incredible fondness for one another and they were going to be lifelong friends forever. But the process of being able to retell this story really did feel like it brought them back together in a big way. Now that's, that's all well and good. You find, uh, you find this kid who tried to buy a Harrier jet from Pepsi and you find his friend who is his financial backer, but, uh, um, the film's so much more than that. So when you, uh, when you, you had to approach a lot of people, um, <laughs> and uh, what was the reaction? Because you've even got the uh, you've even got the the people who produce the, uh, the the brain power behind the Pepsi ad campaigns of the '90s to go on camera. I mean, that how, what what was that like? They must they must have been very cautious about wanting to relive this again. Oh, totally. I mean, you know, what was great about it. I think is that you know. I Obviously, there was challenges. Uh, Michael Patty specifically was just like one of the most fun people I've ever tried to get on camera because, you know, Michael Patty is the guy that came up with this commercial mm -hmm. and has for years and years and years sort of been looked at as though he made a mistake. It's, you know, right. he, he right. has been living with this idea, but, you know, he had information that, you know, he's been kind of sitting on for 25 years. So getting him to participate was like very much like he kind of, felt like he was like the deep throat of this story where, you know, we have to like <laughs> yeah, exactly. in ways and figure right. out like, you know, how can we tell this story without having you feel. But I think the good thing at the end of the day for all those guys and all those guys were so cool and they were so generous. It was that the spirit of this project was really about celebrating, you know, adventure and celebrating the spirit of creativity. And they're, they're all on board with that. And I don't think that like any step of the way, did they feel like they were, stabbing pepsi in the back or whatever i mean this was a, a an isolated incident that was really kind of representative of the bigger world at the time and they were all happy to talk about it and i felt really lucky because of that
Well, and they're creatives too, right? I mean, it's not like you got the legal team. I mean, at least Pepsi's legal team. I think they probably would have not wanted to have any anything to do with you. But uh, if any of those guys are, are women are, are still around. But, uh, but they, I mean, even, well, I don't think this is giving too much away. But, you know, there's some... There's some begrudging respect for what John was was doing. I think it's. It I think out. so, and, and it wasn't. I don't think that that was necessarily apparent to to them or to Michael specifically until we sort of went through this process, which I thought was pretty cool. There was definitely yeah. a moment where he realized, oh, you know what? Like this is the guy that I should be rooting for here. This is the guy that. This is the kid that was supposed to be in the commercial that I wrote. This is the underdog. This is the guy that's like you know, wants right. to show up to school with the sunglasses and, you know, have everyone look at him like he's the cool kid. And and that that's that's a great character. All right. Hey, I think this takes us to a good point to give our listeners a very early break. Uh, but hold that thought. I want to talk more about Michael Patty and those, those characters uh, when we come back. So uh, we'll be right back with uh, Andrew Renzi, the award-winning director and producer of Pepsi, Where's My Jet? Uh, Netflix docu series, docu series, I should say, which uh, is dropping on November seventeenth. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with Andrew Renzi, the director and producer of Pepsi, Where's My Jet? Uh, it's a Netflix docuseries which premiered on November 17th. I highly recommend you check it out. It was a gr- it's, it's four episodes, but my goodness, that flew by. That was a lot of fun, I have to say, uh, watching it. So you were talking about, uh, we were talking about the brains, uh, the original creative genius behind all the Pepsi ad campaigns. I mean, one thing we should say, and we won't reveal anything, but... He has been sitting on stuff for 25 years or so that he does reveal in terms of how this all happened. How did Pepsi go? Because, I mean, just to set this up further, I mean, this the 7,000 points, well, maybe not to give away too much, but it was, you could get it, you could get the plane for a lot less than it was worth, is essentially yeah. what, what was going to happen. Um and so, I mean, we won't go into, but it's it's fair enough to say he, he kind of has the answers into how this did happen. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a there's a there's a exciting moment, you know, in the show where you you kind of un, you end up understanding how a bungle like this actually happens at the mm-hmm. corporate level, you know, and and it's because it really at the end of the day, this really was a bungle. I mean, this was it was mm-hmm. a it was it was a purposeful attempt to advertise something that ultimately would sell more Pepsi. You know, Todd has a great line in the show that I really kind of really stand behind where it's like, you know, if you're little Timmy and you're in the grocery store with your mom and you're walking down the aisle and you see the Pepsi and you see the Coke and you say, mom, I want the Pepsi because I could win a Harrier jet. Like that's Mm -hmm. just the fact. That's why they do these ads. And I think that to go along with kind of making an ad like that, which is there's inherently nothing wrong with that they decided to make it not prohibitive. Like the cost of this jet was not prohibitive. And that's really where the mistake is. (laughs) No, that's where the bungle is. Because, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of adults in the room or older, now older uh, people in the room saying, well, of course it was meant as a joke. Who took this serious? And, you know, uh, well, I won't go into, but there, there's things you can read online that go into more people saying similar things, but let's, let's think about this. I mean, um, you know, we live in a, you live in a country now uh, who, that there, there's, you know, every ad has got a disclaimer, you know, the guy who speaks or a woman who speaks really fast at the end telling you about all the side effects of that medicine or whatever. And, and it's been this case for decades that you always have things at the bottom saying, you know, this isn't this or, you know, whatever, um, can't offer financial advice or whatever. It's, 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 they perp, so, you know, they knew by not putting what they were doing when they didn't put that kind of stuff at the bottom of the screen, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, for sure. Because I mean, if you just look at the next iterations where they, yeah, add, exactly. another, they add another zero to it, because they're like, oh, <laughs> that'll be enough to have people not want to get after this. And then yeah. they're like, Wait, that's probably not enough. Let's put just kidding, you know? Mm-hmm. So like, there's definitely, I mean, regardless, in my opinion, regardless yeah. of whether you think 
clearly this is a joke. You know, regardless yeah. of whatever, if you if you feel like John Leonard is either naive or an opportunist or whatever you want to call him, regardless yeah. of that, it's like you can't put stuff like that on television and 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 have it yeah. not be taken seriously. Like if that ad were were to run in 2022, there would be a million people on Twitter pulling their points <laughs> to go get this jet and exactly. Pepsi would probably have to pay up 500,000 Harrier jets because there would be so many people that would get this. So like, I just love that fact where it's like in the early nineties though, you kind of had to be a lone actor in this kind of thing. And that's what John was. And it's crazy that there was even a human being that would be able yeah. to get so far. I mean, uh, just one thing I do remember at the very beginning, he did say he, I mean, he didn't, well, not to go into this too much because I want to talk about other, other things, but it, there were others who were thinking this, and that's how he kind of got the idea. But he's the only one that actually took it that next step, right? So yeah, yeah for sure. Some people, yeah. His peers were like, that's another the Pepsi part of the generation story. was like, wow, yeah. I can buy a jet. <laughs> totally, and that's another part of the story that I kind of love is that you do have this kind of like difference between Madison Avenue or you know Ivory Tower, kind of like New York City, the court of law. Like you do have. Yeah a big difference between that and like the people that were actually seeing this commercial and very much uncynically thinking that this was an option you know it's like everyone was pulling their points at work everyone was at the mm. football practice you know drinking pepsi until they were you know <laughs> green in the face and that was happening that was really happening yeah. yeah well this strikes me i mean i think this is a very obvious statement but i'm good at that uh this strikes me as a really fun film to make you must yeah. have Ah, oh, my goodness. It's like a, oh, you know, you hopefully have many more of these, but uh, um, what was, uh, I mean, you got budget to go interview fashion models and did you get to, did you get to go to Antarctica yourself? Oh yeah, absolutely. I was there. Oh, still sweet. Got to the top. It was one of the best experiences of my life for sure. Oh my God. Yeah, because we're just, uh, again, we try not to give away too much, but John Leonard in this uh friend Todd or a big avid mountain climber. So you, uh, there are scenes there where you are in Antarctica. That's absolutely amazing. Um, Wow. So, uh, and then, so was it, because, so when you guys, you, because there are serious elements to this, we've kind of touched on a few of things and you've uncovered some, some maybe things that were out there, but no, again, people had forgotten Um, things that Pepsi was involved with at the time. Uh, but, uh, you know, who's, when you were putting this all together, I mean, because you could easily just told the story and that would have been okay. That would have been fun. But uh, yeah. you, you, you've, uh, you, you, it's, uh, it's kind of an homage, isn't it, to, to some films of the 90s and, and it's got a whimsical side to it, which is actually, I mean, was that, I mean, obviously that was purposeful. But what was the thinking when you were, when you guys were saying, how are we going to tell this story? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think that like pretty much the easiest answer for me is that it's definitely in the spirit of, of, of me, you know, this is definitely like something that I gravitate to. I'm, I can, I'm a bit of a, you know, a, a, a manic personality in some ways. And I think right. that there's a lot of fun to be had. And I, and I just feel like we're in a moment right now with documentaries specifically where everything is being told every story is being told every you know there's just no shortage of content that's being put out there and so i think that as a filmmaker the exciting challenge is how to do it differently and how to and how to capture a spirit that might not be something that you see every day from whether it be like the true crime template or the there's just seems there's kind of a template now for a lot of stuff because so much stuff is getting made and that's not to say that i'm like disparaging because i love things that are being made i love Mm. what's out there but this story provided an opportunity to do it just a little differently and to yeah. kind of have it be a little bit more alive in places and lean a little harder into like the cheekiness of that time period right. and not take it too seriously and just sort of say like from start to finish, we're going to go on a ride and we're going to have a lot of fun with this thing. We're probably going to learn something along the way. But at the end of the day, like this thing is just a romp. And that was that was yeah. the whole spirit every step of the way. And your in your subjects seem to be on board with it too. I mean, it's uh, it's it's great. I mean, um, there's some people that pop up that you don't expect to pop up. 
Uh, well, let's put it sure. that way. <laughs> Initials M A. But yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, are we uh, going there? Should we just go there or what? <laughs> yeah, we can go. Yeah, we can go there. I mean, uh, you know, people have. Uh, well, we we're supposed to always have a nice little surprise at the end of the podcast as well. So uh, you know, uh, I mean, Michael Avenatti shows up. I mean, that was like out of nowhere. That came out of left field, and it was like, I mean, did you when you so. I mean, it's like any your documentarian, you're unpeeling the onion and all that stuff. But did you have any idea that he was part of this, you know, when you started filming? Zero. Zero idea. And it's so funny because he – so I had heard, and I'm trying to remember exactly where I heard it. I think I might have heard it from the lawyer, Larry Shantz. If you remember Larry in the show, mm. he's kind of the lawyer that takes the case on from Miami. He was like, oh, you know, I think – Michael Avenatti or somebody might have been involved. And I was like, Michael Avenatti, like, you got to be fucking kidding me. Excuse me. And, <laughs> no and, so, and so I, I, I'm like, okay, I got to figure out. I'm like, is he in jail? Like, where is this guy? So I literally, this is all that happens is I go online. I type in Michael Avenatti. He's got a website. I go on his website. There's a contact page. I go onto his contact page and it's like, you know, info at michaelavenatti.com. I send an email to that info at contact he a couple days later, I get a phone call and he's like, Hey, it's Michael Avenatti. I'm on house arrest in Venice beach, which down the street from where I am in California. Uh, come on over. This is crazy. Like, let's talk about it. So then I go over there and then pretty much for the next year and a half, I would say I would just pop over there with like some, with a hoagie and we'd sit down and we'd talk and we'd hang out and just, <laughs> and I think it was really fun for, it was really fun for both of us because you know, Michael was at a real precipice in his life at that time. Right, it was right. a horrible moment for him. I mean, you know, regardless of whatever you believe about him or whatever, this is still a terrible moment for a human being where he's about right. to go to jail and, yeah. you know, he's reckoning with all these things. And this case represented really the first thing he ever did in his career. The first case he ever got involved in, he mm -hmm. wasn't even a lawyer yet at that time. So I think he kind of looked at it as like, let's, I can reminisce about something that really brings me fondness, you know, mm -hmm. while this terrible thing is happening. And so we just kind of hung out and had a great time for about a year and a half. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, yeah. it doesn't, I had a quick look. I mean, I don't even think, think it shows up on his Wikipedia page. I mean, you know, it's, it's like yeah. for something that's got a big social media presence it, and he has a big presence, obviously. Yeah. It's one of these things that, uh, yeah. Who knew? Well, you, 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 we do now know that, but, uh, it's. Yeah, That's someone will have to edit that Wikipedia page now. I think. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They'll they'll see this, and then they'll someone will get an idea, and they'll get on there. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, no, that's. I mean, I mean, that's. I mean, absolutely amazing. Uh, that and others. I mean, I'm old enough to remember people like the judge that's involved, and you know, so it's just like this little, all these little bits of '90s, not just '90s, but all this history that's come interweave interwoven with with this, which is. Uh, which is, uh, I mean, quite amazing. Um, and then to do the, uh, whose idea was to do the, uh, the, the, the cola challenge of all your It's subjects. a great question. I don't remember the actual sort of like what, when that all came into fruition or came to be. I do, so I did this thing on, I, I made a series um, about the clothing brand Von Dutch, this sort of crazy clothing brand from the early 2000s right. at Hulu. And um I did this thing where I threw the I threw the Von Dutch hat to everybody and they caught the hat and they kind of some people were like, Ugh, like this thing is yeah. disgusting. And some people were like, this thing's so cool. And it's just sort of a way to like get into the character, you know, and get into a real interview moment without having to just sort of force anything. And so it almost felt like an extension of that, to be honest with you. There was almost just sort of like an interview opportunity to loosen people up and have people have mm -hmm. a good time because there wasn't a single person that did the Pepsi challenge that didn't get a laugh about it, you know, that didn't get a good laugh about what they did. And then, yeah. and then getting into the interview is just so much easier because of that. Yeah. Yeah. Watch it and you find out who wins. Um, but is it really a blind taste test? I mean, or do, I mean, how much do you trust these people? Cause I get the feeling some of these people are like, I know that's Coke, but I'm going to pick Pepsi or vice versa, you know, not oh, really. No, I think it was all, it, it was all, it, it was all honest because, you know, there was plenty of people in the show that would, that wanted to choose Pepsi because they worked for them and they would right. go and then they would be Coke yeah. <laughs> and then they're freaking out about it. So I think that pretty much, you know, tw 25 years later, people have probably lost their palate a little bit. <laughs> well, yeah, because we're not even, you're not even, I mean, you had to probably search a little bit to find original Coke and regular Pepsi and not something that had a zero or 
whatever uh, if, with it. So, uh, yeah, no, no, it's quite... Uh, and then to find out that this is, I mean, then this is like a huge legal case. It's taught in le- law schools. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's an amazing story, and it's great to, like, uncover something that hasn't really been been told before. Well, it's been told or documented in the 90s, but to, to relive it, it's quite quite impressive. Yeah, I think that that was ultimately probably one of the bigger draws about the whole thing is that, you know, there's a difference for me between stories that are nostalgic and like stories that are timeless, you know, and I think that right. there's a lot, there's a big draw right now to try to tell nostalgic stories where it's like, yeah. oh, I remember, but like, that yeah. just doesn't have enough teeth for me, you know, it's not, there's not enough there. And then the great thing about this one is that this thing's timeless, you know, it's like, I, one of my favorite parts is just talking to lawyers and they would be, and there wasn't a single one that wouldn't say, I study this in law school. Like, this is the biggest thing that you study in contract law. This is like the foundation <laughs> of your, of your education in, in contract law. And that's cool. You know, that's like, you take this bizarre kind of wonky, wacky case from the nineties that quite literally irreparably changes advertising forever, hmm. made it much more important, I think, than just sort of a silly story from the nineties, you know? Yeah. I mean, you could, exactly, because, I mean, I have to say, we've even had some of those films on. I mean, there's, you know, 90s nostalgia has been pretty hot, but it's, I think that's a good way of putting it. There is a timelessness to your, to this uh, series, which uh, we, again, we don't want to give too much away, but uh, it's more than just about a uh, a 20-year-old going to, trying to buy a, a, a jet with his uh, his Pepsi points, and it's more than just reliving the '90s, and it's more than just there's a there's some lessons here, life lessons. Is that, is that what you want the legacy of this of this film to be? Yeah, I think so, and I think also just like you know, like we talked about earlier, just a celebration of spirit and of boundless creativity, and of just kind of like mm. that sort of effort mentality <laughs> you know like yeah. i'm gonna go try this i'm gonna go do what i can to try to make something happen here and you know so and i think that that's that's really the spirit of the show it's it's definitely you know harkens back to those kind of spielberg films from the 80s you know where you right. just kind of feel like there's an adventure there's an adventure in front of me you get like goonies mm-hmm. out of this thing in my in a yep. lot of ways you know you yeah. just or there's an adventure that's in front of me that I'm going to go try my best to make happen. And whatever happens along the way, you know, the cheesiest phrase you can come up with that I really hold dear and I really believe in is that this thing is perfectly representative of like, it's not the destination, it's the journey. And, and that's, right, that's, right. Like, you know, and that's really what's, what's here. And and I, I love that about this. And any, pr- I mean, so uh, I have to say what usually people may not realize this, but usually when uh, we get films from Netflix or other streamers, usually there's a, someone from a PR company or representative from Netflix online, but we don't have anyone here today, so we can be a bit naughty. But uh, but no, <laughs> I, seriously, uh, we can... Uh, I mean, I don't know why uh, they trust me so much. This I don't know. They, they, they obviously, you know, you, they feel you're, they're in safe hands. Um, or you've been, or you've, uh, you've, or you've uh, had the, uh, the uh, indoctrination, uh, uh, you know, uh, already. But uh, no, I mean, any... Any difficulty selling this? Because a lot of times, I know it's diff. I mean, for all this stuff, you talk about a lot of content out there, and there's a lot of amazing content. But there's still, you know, everyone has struggles selling this, to, selling their projects to studios. And but uh, you know, did this uh, any 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 issues there? Or did this is this something Netflix just lapped right up as soon as you as soon as you offered it to them? Yeah, I mean. Very honestly, like, you know, the team that I had on this thing, uh, you know, Boardwalk Pictures and, you know, my part, my producing partners, Nick and Corkin, I mean, we we had um, a lot of confidence in the project, but you kind of never know, you know, you never know what's going to happen. You never know what people are going to want or what the climate is like at that time and what buyers are looking mm-hmm. for. But there was a little bit of just kind of excitement and urgency about selling this thing and we got really lucky because um, there was multiple people that wanted it. And so I think that kind of changes the dynamic of everything when you kind of get multiple people excited about the possibility of working on this. And so, you know, looking back, I mean, it really was um, one of those sort of dream situations, to be honest with you, where it was really just like everybody. And and again, I think it really relates back to just the spirit of the project. Like everybody kind of got what this thing was going to be and what, what the spirit of this was. And, it was a pretty hard one to kind of like to, to to just say, you know, 
I don't think this is going to be beneficial for our viewers because it's just it's a great <laughs> ride. You know, it's like there's not a lot there's not a lot there to really like you know yeah. kind of controversially pick apart. And so yeah. I think once people realized that like what we were selling them was actually what we were going to make, it, it was yeah. a pretty easy, it was a pretty easy sale. Um, and really lucky for that. Because did you? I mean, was had you envisaged or envisioned uh, that this was a uh, four part series or, or some sort of series, and that's how it was going to that's what you what you were pitching and in the yeah, same I mean, the only, in the tone the, and everything yeah the only thing that was like uh that was definitely up in the air that sort of was throughout the process was you know i really wanted to avoid that like strong strong desire that everybody in my shoes have to stretch stories out right, as far right. as humanly possible for like longer than they need to be stretched out for so that that was always a consideration and so i think like my solve for that as our solve as a team was really to make these a bit more bite-sized to make the episodes a little more palatable so that you're not sitting there for an hour and being like, why am I watching this thing for mm -hmm. an hour four times? You know, the, I want to tune back in. So that was really the goal. Every step of the way was like, if it's 11 PM on a Tuesday and you turn on episode one, like how do we get them to go to episodes two, three, and four without feeling like they're getting exhausted by mm -hmm. it? And so that was really the only like, I'd say challenge um, that I think that I think we landed in a pretty good place with. Well, I would agree with that. I think you did. I I do appreciate. I mean, that's what I love about the streamers. At least you don't. You, it doesn't have to be sixty minutes. It doesn't have to be ninety minutes. It can be. I think one episode's what thirty eight. Another one's like the rest are sort of low forties or something like that. So they are bite sized pieces. You can either I. I did binge watch, but it's not really a binge. I mean, it's not like it's not like binging some you know you know, uh, Breaking Bad or something, you know, it's, it's, yeah, you don't uh, wake up like three weeks later and later. see what happens in life. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You can do it in an evening or you can break it up or whatever, but each in a, each self-contained, each, uh, lovely little, uh, lo each episode is, um, uh, you know, very, very enjoyable. And, uh, um, I was about to say, I'm, I'm always tempted to say, uh, call it dude, where's my car? But, uh, I think we're, uh, but it's Pepsi. Where's my jet? I mean, was that? Uh, that's also an homage, isn't it? It's not. I, you know, it's so funny. I hate to call that an homage because it's you know, not really and I, an homage, yeah. I don't need to go too deep into this. But like when we were coming up with titles for the show, there was definitely you know a really interesting moment for me as a filmmaker where I, where I started to learn about you know what works on Netflix, quite frankly. And this was yeah. this was a conversation about you know, how do we make this title pop as much for people? Cause it's, it's like Netflix is only about click. It's about clickability. It's not about, you know, necessarily um, the poster or the billboard or, or, or the pre-sale or whatever it is. Mm. It's really all about when you're scrolling through your Netflix, like what's going to excite you. So that was a bit of a, a learning curve for me. And I think that the Pepsi where's my jet ultimately is like what, what was decided as really the sort of big, shiny clickable object out there. Mm. And, you know, and it's funny, I kind of was like, I was arguing about it for a while. And I was kind of like, you know, well, doesn't that movie suck? Dude, where's my car? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, are we sure we really want to like, you know, bring those? That yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, can't we like, you know, call this like citizen Pepsi for like citizen? Game? <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. I didn't really say that, but it's like, I didn't want to make a nod to that movie. Yeah. And so I think that like, but what I learned and, and there was a great moment where they had a show come out. Um, if, I don't know if you remember the Manti Teo episode uh, for Untold on Netflix. And right. that episode was called The Girlfriend Who Didn't Exist. Exactly. And it's like, like, you know, traditionally terrible title, right? But yeah. it was very captivating to click right. on. You know, right. like, The Girlfriend Who Didn't Exist, I want to do this. And I'm, so I, I started to really understand where, they're, where they were coming from and we landed on that title as a result. No, we've had some filmmakers. I've, I've asked filmmakers about the titles for netflix films before and it's it's been interesting because one was saying that like yeah you know he the guys come in i mean i don't know what the situation was with that one except that they didn't really have a set title so they were suggesting things which he didn't like so he was busy trying to come up with alternatives and you know mm -hmm. that he thought they would bite on but then there was another group of filmmakers who had a set title this definitely wasn't going to be called and then all they had to have was uh the netflix guy say well if, if we title it that this many people will see it. If we title it what we want to title it, this many people will see it. And they're like, well, go with what you want. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's so funny because my collaboration with them was so incredible. Every step of the way, the creative collaboration, the team, they were so trusting and, and we had this great thing. 
And then the title comes up and it was the only moment where I was like, oh, wait, but like th- I have an idea. But they really did do an incredible job of saying like, well, you know, if you go with your title and it doesn't do well on our platform, then like, you know, it might be because of the title. But if we go with our title and it does badly, we'll take the fall for that one. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so, Fair enough. Okay. Like, let's like, you know, but luckily, I don't feel like I compromise with it. I think it's fun. I actually, te- you know, it's, I actually tested it on a bunch of my friends and they all like this title better than they like my title anyway. So it was a, <laughs> it was a real moment where I was like, you know what? I shouldn't be precious about this because it is a title and hopefully the show speaks for itself. Well, I think, and I, I think it's appropriate. I think it's in this, I think it's, it says it all. Right. Yeah. And basically, exactly. <laughs> that's what they wanted. That was what it was. The girlfriend <laughs> didn't exist. <laughs> well, I think we're actually. I, it's hard to believe, but I think we're starting to we're coming to the end of our our time together, Andrew. But uh, so, what's next for you? I mean, I know you're probably living in the moment and the the glory that is uh, Pepsi. Where's my jet? But any uh, any uh, plans for you? I, I see that you do a lot of producing as well, and now more directing and. Uh, I think you've got a, both a narrative and documentary background. So, uh, which, what's what's next for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm 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 working on a few things, just sort of on developmental level, and uh, I'm I'm leaving for India in a couple of days, where oh, wow. I'm just gonna. I've my first job in film was I was Wes Anderson's personal assistant when I was like 19 years old, and he was no working way. on. Yeah, and he was working on. Darjeeling Limited, and I've always wanted to take the train in India. So I've always always had this dream of going to India and doing the train. So on Saturday, I'm going to India to take the train. And so, so I don't really have anything at the exact moment. I, you know, I've got things I'm working on, but I'm also kind of excited to like, you know, figure out the creative landscape for myself and and make some exciting decisions. Um, you know, with a clear head. So the things I'm working on right now are obviously a priority, but um, but there's also a lot in the future that I can just figure out. So. so thank goodness I asked the question since you raised it. Uh, and I'm a huge Wes Anderson fan. What is it oh, like cool. working with Wes Anderson and or on a Wes Anderson film? That must be amazing. I mean, so I, it's, it's a funny story because I was just this like, you know, punk little kid who was running mm. around New York city trying to figure out what to do with my life. And, uh, and I got an address that I thought was to his office and it was actually to his apartment. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> the bell and my friend, uh, the guy that I knew was like one of his assistants or something. And I got basically an internship because it was, they just needed extra hands. And so I was there yeah. for a month or two interning. And then my friend ended up leaving. So it was just me left. And I, uh, I, I was, it was incredible, you know, cause I was just in his apartment every day, you know, just kind of like hanging out, doing all the things he needed me to do. You know, yeah. there was some hilariously Wes Anderson type tasks where like he'd have a set of three forks and there was definitely a fourth that existed somewhere in the world that he didn't have and I needed to go find you know <laughs> it's like this incredible antique set of forks that there's one missing and it's like go get it you know and so it was a really uh it was it was incredible and and I will say that I was I was not cut out for that job I was I I, I lasted like four months I think and then it was yeah. very clear that I was not the guy for the job he needed somebody that was much more uh capable <laughs> to right assist than me but um he opened up his world to me and i've never been more inspired as like a young wannabe filmmaker to be around somebody like that and truthfully like over the next 10 years i never like i i always felt like if there was i could send him an email and just be like hey like i just made something and he would always write back and he'd always be like congratulations and so there was you know despite probably having zero to no impact on that guy's life personally like he had a huge impact on me wow. so I, i've always been grateful so what do you i mean any insights into his creative process because that's i mean it's a i guess for some people it might even be the i, I don't know what it says about myself but i think for others it looks like the uh the mind of a madman but i i just love the way his mind works but uh what what's what's his day like what is he i mean is, I'm, I'm immersive you know and and, I, and I, I will say that i really developed a respect for that where it's like i mean immersive all he was in pre-production for darjeeling and it was immersive all the way down to the like you know making a mango lassie in the morning wow. you know what i mean like it was very much like let me get into this culture there was books stacked everywhere and you know obviously rewrites probably every day going on and you mm-hmm. know i obviously was not like yeah I, I would you know, there was one, one, actually one thing that I did take away that was part of the creative process that I always really loved was 
you know, he would just have these mixtapes from his um his music supervisor, who's kind of a famous music supervisor, Randall Poster, I think his name right. is. And so he'd have these mixtapes and they would just sit in the in the living room and they'd have a bottle of Campari and they would listen to this music and they would essentially develop the soundscape, the musical soundscape, just through this really kind of casual, wonderful process that I I was like, man, what a dream, you know, to know that you just have any song that you want in the world to be able to potentially pick from. Um, so yeah, it was, it was inspiring. I mean, he had a Criterion collection that was every movie, every Criterion collection that was ever created, he had in a bookshelf. So. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. You know, those must be some, those would be some fucking amazing uh, mixtapes, I tell you. I, you know, you just think about the soundtracks that his films have. I can only imagine what those mixtapes are like. Yeah, if they put those on Spotify, man, those would blow up. <laughs> <laughs> That's a business idea. Um, yeah. If if they, not that he needs to do that or even care. Um, hey, well, thank you. I really appreciate that. And it's, uh, you know, Andrew, it's been great having you on the podcast. I can't believe this is your first podcast so we're we're happy to help you uh to break you in as you get i'm sure you're gonna have many more in your future especially this week so uh a big thank you to andrew renzi the director and producer of pepsi where's my jet the netflix docuseries which premiered on november 17th uh love to have you on again um uh, andrew when you when you drop your next project so uh thanks again yeah, and uh, so. good luck with everything Thank you so much for, you know, your time and your generosity about the show. No, no, it's it's been a lot of fun. So, well, it was, it was a lot of fun watching. That's what I'll say. So, uh, so thank you again and uh, take care. Take care. Bye-bye. I also would like to thank those who helped make this podcast possible. A big shout out to Sam and Joe at Intersound Audio in York, England. Big thanks to Amy Ord, our podcast manager at Alamo Pictures, who ensures we continue getting great guests onto the show and that everything otherwise runs smoothly. Finally, a big thanks to our listeners. Many of you have been with us for four incredible seasons. Please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas, whether it is on YouTube, social media, or directly by email. Please also remember to like us and share us with your friends and family wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Alamo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.